So we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to session four at this point. So what we're going to talk about tonight is a little bit more about shells, and then we're going to get into some scripting, which is a type of programming that you use to kind of chain together a whole bunch of the commands we've been talking about uh, into other commands that you can then run to handle like a list of common tasks or things like that. So uh, we're not going to be working on, I mean, you can really work wherever. You can SSH into a server and work on it, or you can work directly on the VM. It won't matter this week. Um, so the first thing we'll go ahead and look at is a little bit more with pipes and redirection. So we've talked about redirection once before two weeks ago, where we could take the output from a command and pipe it to a file. So for instance, this folder is empty, but if I want to list all the processes currently running on my computer, I can use the ps command or the ones currently running in this terminal if I just run it like that. But if instead of that getting printed to the screen, if I want to print that to a file, I can use the caret operator and then just type in the name of the file. And now nothing prints to the screen, but if we output that file, we'll see the output got printed to the file. We can do the same thing with two carrots. So if we use two carrots, it's going to append to the file, whereas one carrot just always overwrites the file. So if we do this, and now we count the file and see we have all that stuff in there twice. Um, so we discussed that part of it before. We'll look a little bit at some of the slightly more advanced things we can do with it. So the redirection operators by default are just a carrot to create or overwrite a file and two carrots to append to a file. Now, we mentioned this before, we didn't dive into it, but there's really two different formats or two different methods by which programs can output to the terminal, standard out and standard error. So traditionally, when you run something like PS, that outputs just on the standard output because that's the job of the command. Um, if a command throws an error, it'll often output on standard error, and both of them will get printed to your screen. So when you're just looking at the terminal, you're not actually going to know what's on standard error, what's on standard out. It's all just going to land on the terminal uh, like normal. If I, I can probably, I don't know, if I give it a flag that it doesn't know, it's a flag that it wouldn't know. Okay, so if I do something like this, this is probably on standard error right now. We can actually find out in a sec. Um, but it looks just like everything else that's getting printed straight to the screen. So sometimes you want to be able to differentiate those. So it's often useful to pipe just standard error to a file. So if you're running a big, if you're running a big command that's just going to print a bunch of things to the screen, and all you want to you want to come back later and see if any errors occurred by piping standard error to a file, you can let the command run, and when you come back, if there's anything in the file, all your errors will be there. Whereas it won't get mixed in with all the regular output, which will just be on the screen. So if we run these again. Um, so we'll just use the regular pipe out operator again, which by default only pipes standard out. And we'll delete the existing, or we'll just overwrite the existing file. So we're going to pipe with just one, so we overwrite. OK. And we'll see that even though I piped into that file, it still came out on the screen. Because this isn't actually on standard out, this is on standard error. So standard out went to that file, but all of the text we're seeing was on standard error, so it didn't go to the file, it went to the screen. So if we cat that file, we'll see the file itself is empty. So uh, it's useful to be able to manipulate this. So if we wanted the opposite to occur, by default, the caret will just pipe standard out to the file. But if instead we wanted to pipe standard error to the file, we can do that by using um, a number in front of the caret like so. So the number one is standard out. So if we do one and then a caret, we should get the same behavior we saw before. But if we do a two before the arrow, that'll take standard error instead. So you'll note now nothing got printed out. And if we look at that file, it now has the error output. So with the two, the regular output would show up on the screen. There was no regular output because there was only an error. With one, the regular output will go to the file, and the error output will show up on the screen. Uh, my error output is like way bigger than yours. Is that because of something else? Uh, are you running the exact same thing? Yeah. I, I wouldn't worry about it. You may just have a slightly different version of the command. Um, but it is often helpful to be able to differentiate between. So this and with a one are the same are the same thing. It defaults to a one if you don't give it anything. But it's often useful to be able to differentiate between just doing one or just doing two. 
Now, sometimes you want to be able to pipe both to a file, so you send everything to a file, be it standard out, be it standard error, or whatever. Um, so to do that, uh, it's actually a two-step pro process. First, you have to, uh, this is going to get a little bit into pipes and, and how some of this stuff works behind the scenes, but, yeah, that's what I was, oh, well, that's true, okay. So the easiest way to do both is just to put an and in front of the character. Uh, which will send both standard error and standard out. So if we do this, no matter what comes out of the command, it's going to go to the file. So if you're in a situation where you absolutely don't want anything, you want to guarantee that nothing will get printed to the screen, you always use an and, because that'll ensure that both standard error and standard out get piped to the file. So if we cap the file now, again, it's we're looking at an example that only has standard error. Um, if we looked at an example that only had standard out, and we piped standard error to the file, or if we pipe both to the file, then we'll see that standard outs in the file as well. Questions on the difference between the one carat, two carats, and then putting the number one or two in front of it? Okay, so you can also, sometimes it's useful to, I don't know, is it worth showing how to switch them? Okay. Right, right. Um, so there are actually ways to swap to like send standard error to standard out and then send standard out to standard error, so you can basically swap which is which. Uh, we won't dive into that right now. Um, the other thing that becomes really useful is the pipe operator. So the caret operators, I was calling the pipes, should be called redirection operators, they always go to a file. So they always take your output and send it to a file. The redirection operator on the, or the pipe operator on the other hand is the single bar, it sends to another command. So what this is going to do is take the output from this command, or by default, it's going to take standard out from this command and send whatever gets put on standard out of this command to whatever command I put next. Um, so if I do a, uh, another command after this, like sort or something, it'll go ahead and take the output, sort it, and then display it to me. Um, you can actually do this multiple times, so I could send it to sort, and then I could send it to, I mean, tails that are, send it to less. And we'll get the sorted output, and now it'll be inside less, so it'll allow me to scroll through it. If it were big enough to actually scroll through, it's not, so I'll say Q to exit. Um, but in this, this is a really powerful property of the way a lot of commands work in Unix, because you can just take a bunch of these commands that do one little thing and chain them together to be kind of get something that's a lot more powerful than one of them by themselves. Um, now, just like there's the, uh, just like by default, this is only going to pipe standard output. So if I throw an error, make it throw an error again, we'll see it's not sorting this because this is on standard error. And by default, this is only working on standard output. So sometimes you want to be able to do the same thing. You want to be able to pipe the standard error output. Uh, and in order to do that, what we essentially have to do is here's where we do have to basically send standard error to standard out and then the pipe will work on it. So there is no way just to put a number in front of the pipe. Uh, the pipe only ever works on standard out, and if you want standard error there, you need to forward standard error to standard out first. So we can do that by using kind of a combination. So if we want to take standard error, we'll do what we did before. So we have the two and the caret, but instead of putting a file name here, we're gonna do an ampersand one. So what the ampersand means is this isn't a file, this is going to be, or it is a file that's one of these special files, standard error, standard out, and then the one means standard out. So this is saying take the standard error output, send it to the regular output, and then take the regular output and send it to sort. So if we run this, we'll notice we now get a nice and completely unreadable error message because it's been sorted by the first character. Uh, why would we want to use something like sort in an error message? Won't make any difference, right? Uh, so, I mean, so sort's just a... An example. Maybe. An example. Uh, maybe you would want to sort error messages. If your error message always started with like some kind of an error code, it might be useful to sort it so you could scroll down and see if a certain code was occurring. Uh, but yeah, you could you could put anything here. Um, you could, I mean, so if you were, the, the more common thing is you'd probably put your app here and you would search for some error message or something that you wanted to see if it was occurring. Um, so if I grep this for the word details, so I'll get just the word details from the output. Whereas if I don't do this little redirection first, I won't get anything because that's on standard error by default. 
So you can actually do the opposite too. Uh, this is less useful, but you can take standard out and send it to standard error. So if I do this, I'm not going to get anything either because there is nothing on standard out. It's only on standard error. If I do this without the error, then I also, it's not actually grepping for anything uh, for the same reason. Nothing is on standard out anymore. We're taking standard out and putting it all on standard error. So questions on what this is doing or what the pipe operator is doing? OK. So this is, like I said, a really core concept. Uh, the basic Unix mentality is each program should do exactly one little thing. And because we have the pipe operator, you can then do more complicated things just by chaining the other programs that do simple things. Uh, so we'll come back to this when we get into some more scripting. The other thing we're going to talk about is, so we, we haven't jumped on this a lot yet, but the program, this terminal we're in right now is actually a program in and of itself. Uh, it's running what we call a shell, where the shell is essentially this interactive environment that allows me to launch commands, and the shell takes them and sends them to the operating system to actually get run, takes the results and sends it back to me. So it's a lot, it's transparent in some ways, but um, we are actually sitting inside a program right now. And if we run PS, it'll, we kind of get a hint of that. Bash right here is the name of the shell that we're running. So Bash stands for the born again shell. There's actually different, there's different programs that do this. There are different shells. Uh, Bash is a pretty standard shell that you're going to find yourself using on most computers. It's more or less the de facto standard. Um, but this is a program just like everything else. So we're sitting inside a program right now, and this program has some special features that we can take advantage of. Uh, if we run the help command, you'll get a list of essentially all of the special features that your shell can actually do. So these, everything listed here in help, these aren't regular commands. These aren't like, you gotta be careful because sometimes these override the regular commands, but these aren't like the ls command or something like that, where when you run the ls command, ls is actually a program sitting on the computer uh, in actually slash bin. So we can actually search for the program itself. If we list the output of the slash bin directory and we grab it for ls, we'll see we get this right here. So there's actually an executable program in a file by itself that runs every time we type in ls. Whereas the things that we see in here, like when I type in help, this isn't going to that ls, this isn't going to that bin directory and like running a help command. This is help is a built-in command within the shell. So help only works when I'm within bash. I mean, most shells have some form of help. But this isn't calling like a global system command. This is calling a special parameter within the shell I'm currently working in. Um, so it's kind of like if you're in Emacs, you're in DI, and you do a hotkey that does something within the program itself, that's just local to that program, just like these are local to whatever shell you happen to be in. Uh, let me run through the, we'll hage this so we can actually look at it all. Um, now, this does get a little bit confused because sometimes your shell will have, a, have its own version of a system command, and then when you run it, it's going to run your shell's version, not the actual system version. The one place you actually run into this a lot is with the time command. So if we scroll down here, we'll see bash has its own built-in version of time. Uh, what the time command does is it doesn't tell you the time. The date command tells you the time. The time command tells you how long it takes a program to run. So it's essentially a timer that times a program. Um, so if we just run the time command and we run it on something simple like PS, we'll see it prints out these three things at the bottom. We get the output from the PS command, then we get the output from time, and it gives us these are three different measurements of how much time the program took to run. But this time, if I actually look at the man time page, we'll see time has a bunch of nice commands. In particular, it has like this verbose command that'll put it, put out a lot of extra information for us. So let's go ahead and try to run it with the verbose command. And we'll see I get this error message, verbose command not found. That's because right now when I run time, I'm not actually running the time command that the man page is referring to. I'm running the built-in version of time that bash refers to, which is way more limited than the main version of time. So if I actually want to run the system version of time, I have to type in the full path. So I have to tell it bin time. And then if I run it, yeah. So it's, it's not always, not always in slash bin. Sometimes they're in slash user slash bin. 
But now you'll see it works and I get all this extra output. So if you're running a command that's also a built-in command and you're wondering why it's not doing what the man page says it should be doing, you may very well be running the built-in version instead of the original version of the command. Normally the man page will warn you about this. So if we look at the man page and at least it used to warn you about it. Oh, here we go. See? Users of the bash shell need to use the explicit path in order to run the external time command and not the shell built-in variant. So uh, this is warning us that if we actually want to use the full version of the time command, this man page is telling us that we have to run user bin slash time, not just time by itself. Questions on the difference between kind of these built-in functions that are a property of the terminal and then like actual system commands? Okay. Just one quick question. Uh, the man um, it will give you the instruction for the bash, right? No, the just no, the system version. So if we wanted instructions on the bash version, we type in help time. So to get help on stuff that's built into bash, you always use the help command. Man always refers to like the system wide, the, the real version of the command, uh, kind of the core program. Any other questions? Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's not so much that you really need to worry about the difference between what's built into Bash and what's built into the core system, because for the most part, they're gonna behave the same, but do realize every now and then you're gonna run into a little side effect of what's going on behind the scenes, so it's good to understand it. Uh, also realize that if you're using a shell other than Bash, so the C shell is actually another shell, uh, it's not gonna have the same built-ins. So it doesn't even have a help. Uh, so whereas in Bash, help showed me all the built-in Bash commands and the C shell, help doesn't do anything at all. Uh, so, there, whereas the system commands are gonna work no matter what shell we're in, the built-ins are only gonna work if we're in the shell that actually has them. So, what exactly is a shell? It is a, so a sh interface which you use to? It, so, a shell is basically the interface between you and the operating system. So, it's kind of a low-level program that's running underneath us that's doing a number of things. It's generating this nice prompt for us. Uh, it's also, I mean, we'll get into some of the other things it does here. It actually lets us run a number of commands at once. Uh, it lets us do all the piping and stuff. All of that's kind of the shells handling that for us. Um, so yeah, it's kind of the thing that sits right between you and the raw operating system and makes your life easier. Other questions? So you can actually launch multiple versions of a shell. So uh, let's see if they'll get listed here. So if I run bash and then run ps, you'll see there's actually now two versions of bash. So I'm running a copy of bash inside a copy of bash. So uh, you can nest them. If I do exit now, I'll exit back to the top layer. If I do exit again, it'll actually close bash altogether, right? It'll close my terminal. Uh, but that is occasionally useful to be able to call other versions from within it. Okay, so some of the other things that are built into your shell that become really handy. Uh, probably the most common thing you'll end up doing is what we call the background command. And what it does is it takes a command and it runs it in the background. So instead of having to sit there and wait on the output, you can go start running other commands while it's completing for you in the background. Um, so there is a command on, what will this great number of seconds? Pause. So if I run the command sleep three, it just takes up three seconds and then pops me back to my terminal or however many seconds I specify here. So this is a purely artificial example. Uh, I just need something that's gonna take some time so I can demonstrate. So say if this weren't sleep, if this were some big program that took a few minutes to run, uh, we'll get 15 seconds. I don't necessarily wanna sit here for the full 15 seconds or more importantly, if this is like two hours, I don't necessarily wanna sit here for the full two hours and let this complete, especially if I'm SSH'd in somewhere where like I can't, so right now I can go click on other things, but if I'm SSH'd into a machine, this is just gonna be tying up everything that's going on. Um, so what it's useful to be able to do is throw this into the background, let me work on other things, and then it'll just give me the output when this is done. Um, so the amper, if you stick the ampersand after a command, that puts it into the background by default. So if we'll do this, you'll notice I get back my prompt right away, but then it gives me a number and a process number. If I do PS, we'll see the sleep commands running. It's just not running in the foreground, it's running in the background. 
I do PS again, so here in a few seconds it should disappear. Okay. So it did complete in the background. You'll notice that I got this little printout on the screen that said sleep 15, which is the command I got, and it just finished. Um, you can actually rejoin. So if the command's in the background, but then you actually want to bring it up to see what's running, you can use the command foreground with this FG, and then you type in the job number that it's been out here, so this first number of brackets. So if I do FG1, we'll see it's going to bring me back into tying up my terminal, and until the time finishes, uh, it's going to put me there. If we do this with Emacs, which is probably a more useful example, so I don't know why you would ever launch Emacs in the background, but there might be a good reason to. If you're using the windowed version of Emacs, you actually do end up doing this, because if you have a program that launches a window that you're going to go interact in, then it's useful to still have your command prompt. But I launched Emacs. It's running in the background right now. But now if I actually want to use Emacs, because it's an interactive program, I need to pull it into the foreground. So if I do foreground, again, it's job number one. We'll see it actually brings me into Emacs now. And then I can actually exit Emacs with Control x Control c and it'll pop me back down. If I launch a handful of jobs in the background, so we'll launch a whole bunch of Emacs, you'll notice that this jobs number actually started to keep tick up. Sometimes it's useful to be able to see what all's running in the background. So your terminal has another built-in command called jobs that'll show you what's running in the background. So right now I have four copies of Emacs running in the background, and they're numbered jobs one through four. So I can pull any of these into the foreground. I could do foreground three, and it'll bring up Emacs. Now I'll close that. If I run jobs again, we'll see the other three ones are all still running, so I can pull them up one at a time. Foreground one, foreground four, foreground, oh, that's And then when I close them all, the jobs list will be empty again. So you can always use jobs to kind of give you a clue as what's all running within your terminal. Jobs is a little bit related to the PS command. The PS command works on the operating system level, so it just fits back process numbers, whereas the jobs command is built into your terminal, so it'll give you, if I do a handful of those, or if I run a couple again. So if I run jobs, and spell it correctly, uh, so jobs doesn't give me the process number, which was that four-digit number we were seeing before. Instead, jobs gives me the job number. And the foreground and the background command need the job number, so you tend to use jobs if you want to see what's kind of in the background of your terminal, whereas PS is more useful just to looking at what's running system-wide. Are those all running concurrently, or are they stacked to run in order? Well, they're going to run they're, Yeah, they're running. Yeah, so it kind of it depends on the scheduler on your operating system, but by default, Linux has a round robin scheduler, kind of, it's more complicated than that, but uh, if you have a multiprocessor chip, they're actually going to be running in parallel. Uh, if you have a single core chip, only one thing can run at a time, but it's going to give you the illusion of running in parallel because it's going to time slice them. So it's going to give one a millisecond, and another millisecond, and another millisecond. So for all intents and purposes, they run in parallel, whatever that happens to mean on your given system. Then what's the plus and the minus? that show up after the job numbers? Do you know? Um, uh, I don't know. And those are, so Emacs looks like it's stopping itself. Right. So they're not actually running. Yeah. But um, you could have a bunch that say running. I don't know what the plus or minus is. This is the job status. So some jobs will, uh, sleep's probably a better example. So if I throw a couple of sleeps in there, and we'll throw a couple of one minute sleeps in there, two seconds sleep. So now if I run jobs, you'll notice the two sleep commands say running. So Emacs is smart enough to detect that it's an interactive program, and if it's not in the foreground, then it's, there's no point in it running because it can't possibly be doing anything right now. So Emacs is essentially putting itself to sleep until I pull into the foreground. But these sleep commands are actually going to continue to run in the background. Uh, I think what this plus or minus probably corresponds to is the defaults. So if you just do foreground without any number at all, by default, it's going to pull up, yeah. So it's going to pull up the last thing that has a plus next to it. Normally, that's the last command that ran. But as you saw with something like Emacs followed by some commands that are actually running, it has slightly different behavior. Um, so I, I'm pretty sure I, the minus then must be whatever one. I, I mean, the one or one behind that or something. Uh, but I think they have some relation to what the default's going to be if you run foreground with no parameters. Do you know uh, putting foreground process in the background? Uh, yes. 
so uh, often you'll start a program not in the background. So if you pull something from uh, background to foreground, can you put it back in? Background? Yes, that's what we'll do right now. So uh, maybe you have something that you forgot to start in the background, or maybe you pulled it into the foreground and you want to send it back into the background. So if we just run sleep like this, we're sitting in it right now. If I do control Z, well, that'll sleep it. Um, so control Z sends a signal to the program that tells it to go to sleep, which also, if I run jobs right now, we'll see. So I have this last sleep command, and it's currently stopped. Um, but I can start this sleep command in the background by running the BG command is going to say, so you have to stop it first because that's what gets you out of it. But now if I want to continue having it execute in the background, I can do the BG command followed by whatever job I want to keep executing. So I'll just do background seven. Now if I do jobs, we'll see it switched it to running. So you can put a job back into the background. It's kind of a two-step process. First you stop the job and then you restart it in the background using the BG command. There's no direct shortcut to send it straight to the background. Just and I think the most useful feature, the most useful time for that is when you're in your editor, like they were Emacs, and you want to get onto the command line, uh, you can put the editor in the background. Uh, control, control. Yeah, so if I'm doing something like editing some file, and I want to, so Emacs actually lets you open like 10 files at a time, so with one file this is less useful. With one file you generally just save it, close Emacs, do you need to do it, reopen it, but if I have like 10 files open, closing Emacs is going to be a pain in the ass. So if I want to go to the command line, it might be useful for me just to do a control Z. That's going to throw Emacs into the background. Now I can go do whatever else I need to do. And then if I do, so by default, if I just run foreground, it should bring it up. But I'll double check. So if I do foreground 8, it's going to bring me right back to where I was when I was editing before. Uh, the other place this is good to know is, especially in Emacs, where all of your shortcuts are control X something, you will, on occasion, accidentally hit Control Z, and if you don't know what you just did, then all of a sudden you think you killed your program and all of your work's gone. And it's not gone, you just stopped it. You just have to do a, either just do foreground or do jobs to find the number, and then do foreground and the number, and it'll pull you right back to where you were. So if a background job's trying to use standard output, does it wait until it gets to the foreground? No. No, it just gets it. They're all gonna get interweaved. So normally when you put something in the background, you will pipe its output to a file first because it's not terribly useful, especially if you're running multiple background jobs, just to have output all getting thrown at you in whatever semi-non-deterministic manner they happen to get run. Um, so yeah, it, generally if things are set up to run into the background, you always are piping their stuff to you. You're piping their output to some file first, which protects it and, and makes sure you can find it later. So questions on jobs, foreground, background, control Z. Uh, will standard out from a job running in the background actually be thrown on the Yes, it'll just, it'll, it'll pop right up. Um, uh, what's a good example of something that'll pause? And then I guess I can change two commands together. Well, yeah. Matt will let me show you when we get to doing scripts. Is there a command that I'm just going to spit out output every few seconds that I could demonstrate what happens when you get output from a background command? Uh, I guess I could do like cat top cat mouse. Cat, cat. Yeah, I do, or something like that. Do you know what it is? Event. All right, but uh, event or mouse. I don't know which one it is. Try it. Let's see if any of these work. Anyway, uh, it might be more work to demonstrate this than it actually turns out to be. I don't know if I know. All right, I'm not going to search through them all right now. Um, but you could, in fact, uh, yeah, if you get output from a command that's running in the background, it just gets spit out onto your screen. So top will actually be a semi-decent demonstration. Is it that what we standard error? A little bit, sounds weird. Let's find out. Um, OK, so we're running top in the background. And in theory, every few seconds, top should update. But maybe it won't. Works by sending yeah. So it must not. Okay. So. So never mind. I'll foreground top. And Emax.
Uh, you can also, you can, is there a way to kill a job here at home? Kill, that's why it kills. Uh, what's that it's like a percent or something. Okay, there we go. So if you do kill with a percent, you can kill a job directly uh, instead of having to give kill the process number, which we could also find by running PS. Um, but sometimes it's useful if you already know the job number just to use kill a percent and the job number directly. One other question. When you do control Z, it stops all the jobs? Uh, no, it only stops the foreground job. So at any given time, you can only have one foreground job. You can have an unlimited number of background jobs, but per terminal instance, there can only ever be one foreground job and control Z, or really any of the control commands. So control Z and control C both send signals, and those signals always go to the foreground job. That's one of the things your terminal handles. Um, so whatever's in the foreground is gonna catch those symbols. If nothing's in the foreground, like right now, and I do control Z, nothing's gonna happen at all. Any other questions? Uh, how do we uh, swap out the process in the background? So if you do, I mean, there's a couple of ways to do it, but you can do, Break everything. Oh. Okay. Uh, you can do. I think I broke my terminal with all the special characters. Okay, cool. So if you run jobs, uh, you can kill it by the job number. So this number here, by doing kill and then percentage job number. So if I want to kill that first Emax, it'll be percent one. Now if I do. I do jobs, we'll set down as one. You can also still use PS. So if I do PS, I'll get the process numbers and then I can use kill without a percent. So yeah. kill without a percent given one of these process numbers. So if I want to kill the other instance of Emacs, it's going to be 4123. Then if I run jobs, we'll see. Uh, um, so Emacs isn't the best example because there's actually if you do kill, the kill will send multiple, send different types of commands, it sends different types of signals. Uh, so the nine is the one that says make sure you shut down, whereas the other one is just kind of asking nicely to shut down and Emacs ignores that. Um, but you can use the kill command and the process ID, or you can use the kill command with a percent and the job ID. Either one will kill it. Yeah, but that would like completely kill the process? Uh, yes. But rather than that, if I wanted to stop it, kind of to emulate the control Z, Oh, you want to take a process that's running in the background? Yeah, and that's the problem for now. You have to bring it to the foreground. Oh, uh, okay. Well, control that's, it. or, yeah, or you, yeah. The easiest way to do it would be bring it foreground to control Z. You can also, kill will send the stop command. Um, I have to look up what the number is, but if we look at these list of signal, oh, it's not in this man page. I'd have to look at the man page that lists all the signal numbers, but you could actually use kill with a dash instead of a nine, it would be some other number, and that would be the stop, and then I would just give it the process ID of what I want to stop. Um, so you can stop it without bringing it in the foreground first. Uh, kill is kind of your catch-all tool for doing all of that. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So some other things we are going to look at kind of quickly is your terminal is also capable of doing some uh, kind of like wildcard type expansion for you. So the one we've looked at a few times is, so if I just do ls and then like a star, what this is gonna do is it's gonna list all the files that start with an a and then have zero or more of anything after it. So I do ls a star, we'll see I just get this list of things that start with an A, or this is also then recursively running LS on any folders that start with an A, which is why we're getting some of this other stuff. Um, maybe I will go into, okay, so if I make a few files here, <coughs> So I have a list of files here. If I do ls a star, then my terminal is going to go ahead and expand this to every possible completion of a in my current folder. So ls a star is going to give me a listing for everything that starts with an a. There's other things you can do. If I do ls a question mark, this finds anything that starts with an a and has exactly one other character after it. So this should produce nothing, yeah, um, because I have nothing. But if I do something like, so we have this ABSC here, so this has A with three characters at it. 
So if I do A with three question marks, it'll give me that. So the wildcard matches an unlimited, or the asterisk matches an unlimited number of characters. The question mark matches just a single character. So this is a single character wildcard versus a unlimited number of characters wildcard. Um, I can also give it some basic parameters uh, if I want it just to match a subset of things. So if I do, so this will list anything that starts with an A, has a B in the second position, and it has anything after that. So we'll see I have two files that meet that criteria. Um, I could do anything that has a B or A. Let's see what I, okay. So let's, I could do anything that starts with an A or a G. And it's gonna give me all of those. So if you put more than one thing in brackets, it'll, it basically takes it as a list of possible matches. So it'll do anything that's A or G or whatever else you happen to add here. Um, so you'll see whereas before, so this is the same as this, essentially. But if we use brackets, I can start adding other characters and start picking up additional matches. So questions on kind of what the brackets do, what the question mark does, or what the uh, asterisk does. You can also invert the match. Do I put this in front? Yeah, like well, the, the, the no, big, no, Bastion is this. Yeah, but, so the big one is the star. Right. The, the general concept is blotting, and you might want to do like remove star dot out because you ran some program that generated a bunch of dot out files, or you ran your compiler and you want to remove star dot o to clean up all the objects that were compiled. Yeah. Nine times out of ten, the star is what you're going to need. But know that the question mark and you can't actually do grouping. You can also use a hat, which will invert the match. So you can say anything that doesn't start with an A or a G. Um, and that's right, if we go too far down this road, we start getting the full fetch regular expressions. These aren't actually regular expressions, though. They're not intended like that. Um, but knowing the star is really handy because often you will have something in a specific file type, or you'll want to get rid of all the temp files in a folder, or you'll have a whole bunch of files that like start with temp dash. So you would do something like rm temp dash star. There are none of those in my file, but if there were, it would do this. Um, Question. Yeah, how did you learn the functions of these weird characters? What do you mean? Like the star, like the brackets. How? Where did you learn that? Uh, it seems like I cannot find that from the ls. Then. So it's not because it's not part of the ls command. This is a property of the terminal, or the not terminal. This is a property of the shell. So our shell is taking this, changing it before it even sends it to the ls command. So the ls command never even sees this star. The ls command just sees the, the terminal is going to go ahead and expand this to all the possible matches and then send all of those to ls. Um, so this is a property of the terminal. There's probably a page. That so talks you open up the man page for bash and search for glob. That's where it is. Yeah. Um, so right. So if we read through all of this, there's. It's a huge man. Page. Yeah. So if we start searching, you can search a man page by hitting the forward slash and typing in what you want to search for. Um, you can also always do H in a man page to get a list of all the commands. So if I want to search for the next match in this man page, I, it's to yes with one. So if I just keep hitting in, it's going to go through. Yeah, so there's it, it, what this property is called is called globbing. So if we go through here, uh, there it was, pattern matching. So if you'll see here in the man page for bash, here's it's describing what the asterisk does, here it's describing what that does. So it's not a property of ls, it's a property of bash, which is why it's in the bash man page. And it was basically the same for all the different kinds of shells. Yes, so you, uh, it's basically the same. Bash, so the asterisk's always going to do that. Mm. Uh, other shells might not have things like the ability to do multiple, like do the brackets and stuff. Uh, bash is a pretty advanced shell. Um, but yeah, you would look in your shells man page for whatever shell you happen to be using with those features. Thank you. Any other questions? It is important though to realize that this is a property. The shell is dealing with this before it even sends this input to the program. Because if you guys start writing your own programs, you can now take advantage of all these features without, you don't have to handle them in your program. It's not your problem. So you could write your own program that cuts off the last word in every file, and you can still use this to call it on a list of files, and it's going to work correctly, because Bash is going to correctly expand this to a list of files and then send each file to your program. 
So it is, uh, it is a property of Bash, and it does become very handy. OK. So the one other thing we'll touch on briefly is most shells also have some kind of history. Uh, Bash does. So if we, again, the man page for Bash is where you would find out the details for all of this. But the most often, if you do Control R, it'll put your Bash into this reverse I search, which basically means it's going to search all the commands you've run in reverse order. So if I want to start searching for, if I start typing in kill, we'll see I'm going to get the last command I ran that had to do with kill, which was man. Uh, I can then use the up arrow to, to select through, um, or to, I guess, start scrolling through my history at that point. Um, so this is just a way, when you use the up and down arrows, you're also going through your history. Using Control R just lets you kind of jump to your history via search, which can be more helpful. Uh, there's other ways to do this search. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head because I always just use Control R, but the Bash man page would tell you all of them. You can also do some very basic editing on the command line. So let's say I scroll up to a previous command I like, and let's say I have this long file name here, and I don't want to retype it, but I need to use it somewhere else. So you can actually copy and paste from your terminal. Uh, it uses shortcuts, generally the same shortcuts as Emacs. So Control K is, you can cut and paste. There is no copy. Um, so Control K is cut, and then Control Y is going to paste that again. So I could take some part of a command, I could cut it, and then I could scroll over to some other command, and I could paste it and run it with respect to that command. So sometimes it's useful to be able to cut and paste parts of your commands. Um, there's a library behind the scenes that's, that's actually doing all this magic for you. Uh, but you do have a history. You can actually type in, if you type in the word history, it's going to show you all of the commands you've run since you started your session. If you want to clear your history, history-c will erase that list. So we'll see, now we get nothing. Um, Often your history is propagated across sessions. So next time you log into the computer, your history will pick up where you left off. This is a really handy thing if you want to be able to, if you're constantly logging into a server and running the same commands, it's useful. But it also means that if you're in a position where you don't want someone else to be able to get on that machine and see all the commands you ran, then you do need to think about clearing your history before you log out. Uh, most often logging out does not clear your history automatically and it persists. Um, so there are a lot of other built-in features to Bash. Again, if you run help, you can read all about, or if you look at the Bash man page, you can spend all day reading the man page and finding everything that Bash can do. But uh, most shells are going to kind of provide these same basic things, some form of wildcard logging or expansion, some form of basic history to go through your things, and then the ability to do foreground, background jobs, see the list of all the jobs that are running, switch things between foreground, background. Those tend to be kind of the core terminal functionality. All right, so the last thing is your terminal also has what's called environmental variables. So these are generally strings that hold like a value of a whole bunch of files. So one of the common ones are we can, I'll just print them out, we can talk through some of them. Um, uh, what's the list on my environmental variables? Okay. So I'm going to take the output of this command and type it to less because there's a lot. But if I type in env, it basically shows me these are all variables and then the values they're set through. Various programs will use these to figure things out. So the most common one, well, okay, so right now this shell being set to bin bash means that if some program wants to find out what the default shell is, it can just look at this shell variable and then get a string back that describes the path to the current shell. Um, some of these also, so the ls command, you'll notice when you run ls, it color codes the output. So ls actually has to have a way of knowing how to do that. So this ls colors is listing all of the different color codes for all the different file types on this system. And then when I run ls, ls looks at this variable and uses it to pick out what colors it's going to draw from. Probably the most common environmental variable, okay, so I use my machine with Amazon EC2. So when you set up your Amazon account, it requires you to set up a bunch of these environmental variables. Because Amazon has scripts that you run, and the scripts go to look for these environmental variables to figure out, in my case, like what account to go access on Amazon uh, and stuff like that. I, I think you're probably not going to want to that part. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, no, that's that's not secure because you need my key. Yeah, you know, but you need my no, that's not the key. That's just the path. That's just my unique identifier, and then there's a path. Don't worry about it. It's good. <laughs> 
Um, you can't actually write anything like that. Although saying that on YouTube is just a <laughs> challenge for someone to try, right? Um, the real common one you see here, path, this, whatever the path variable is equal to, this is all of the things you can run by default on the command line. So when you type in a program on like a CD or something on the command line, it goes through this list of locations, searching for a program called CD, and then runs the first one it finds. So you'll notice that the first place it starts searching is, well, so it searches some special uh, things for Ubuntu, uh, but then it does search the slash bin, it searches slash user slash bin, somewhere in here. Uh, so these are essentially the list of all the commands that I can just type in and expect to run. Sometimes you want to add to this, again, with all the stuff I do on Amazon, I have a folder full of these scripts that Amazon uses. So instead of, I don't want to have to type the full path to that folder and then the name of the command every time, I just want to type the command like I do everything else. So I need to add that folder to my path variable so it knows when I type that command to go search in that folder to actually find that command. Um, you can actually view any single environmental variable using the echo command. So to access an environmental variable, you always start, or really any variable fast, you always start with the dollar sign. And then if we type in the name of one of those variables like path, so I do echo path, it's going to print out the value of the path variable. Or if I do echo, or if I do echo shell, it's going to print out the value of the shell variable. Uh, so this is how you get access to these. If you're writing a script that needs to go and look at one of these environmental variables, uh, you can get that environmental variable back via this. Uh, so you wouldn't normally use the icon, I'm just using the icon to print it out, but via the dollar sign in the name of the variable. When you did env, was that a file or a command? That's a command built into my shell. It's a built-in as well. Um, but yeah, env is going to go ahead and it just spits out the list of all the known environmental variables. So the manual page for that says run a program in a modified environment. How does that uh, So That's the not yeah. built in. Yeah. So you're, that's the same issue we were talking about with time earlier. So the man page, there is another env. So there's the env program, which if I run slash user slash bin. So this is what the man page is talking about. But when I run just env by itself, I'm getting the bash version of env, which uh, I don't know all the bashers are going to tell me about it. Um, but by, yeah, we're using the built-in version of ENV here, so it's overriding the bash is catching it and interpreting it before it even goes to look for the real ENV. Okay. I know, every now and then it's confusing. Where are all these environmental variables stored? So, they're stored in memory. Uh, they're just, all of these actually get initialized when you boot up your system, so um, we can look at one without going too long here because I want map to get to stuff, but uh, you have a bunch of files that automatically get run when you when you start up your system. So in all your home directories you have this .bashrc file. This basically stores a list of configuration for bash itself. And if you, there's a, there's a lot of things that you can change in here. Um, you can change like the size of your history, that kind of stuff. But if we look in here, it actually sets some environmental variables. So if you look right here, uh, it's checking an environmental variable. Let's see if I can find one where it's setting other. Oh, so here it's setting this environmental variable. So uh, a lot of these, this file gets executed every time I start a new shell, and then it's setting up all these environmental variables, and then they just are stored in memory. Other questions? Uh, sorry, I'm still confused on that. So if I do just help, I should get all the yeah. Does, all it, the not bash list, does it, it not list the NV on there? No. Um, no. So it may be that ENV is a property of the terminal. I don't think ENV is a property. Um, it's a function. Well, it's definitely not this ENV. So. Um, you can do this kind of shortcut thing where you set a variable and then run a program with the variable set only for that program. And that's kind of a built-in feature of Bash. But I guess older shells don't let you do that. So you can do an env variable equals value and then the program name. Because unfortunately, you know how we've been doing dashes and stuff to set options for programs? Some programs take their arguments through environmental variables. You don't configure them on the command line or something you both. 
So you might want to set the path when you're running a program. But I think the just, question's just still for that program. Why are we getting this the non command version of ENB? If you do ENB and the type of program name, I'm pretty sure it'll run that program. So you think the default behavior for ENB with nothing is just to list all the environmental variables? Yeah. So we may be running this version, and it may just be that when you run it with no arguments, it just lists everything. Um, I'd have to look at the man page in more detail. Uh, but yeah. Any other questions? OK, I'll let Matt start so we can actually get in. We're going to touch on a lot of this again as he goes into some scripting. Um, but we'll go with Matt. Can I ask a general question about the shells? Mm -hmm. why, why would you use you know, Bash shell versus C shell or Corn shell, or why do you some distributions like BSD from the default shell? For the same reason you'd use Emacs or Vim. Um, so different shells are different features. Bash is pretty full feature. It's also heavyweight. So if you're in a really resource sensitive environment, you're probably using something like C shell that's a much lighter weight shell. Uh, it takes up a lot more, has a much smaller footprint. Um, some people just prefer, so some of the syntax for like how you do like that number before the arrow, that's bash specific. Some other shells have like the C shells a different way of doing that. So sometimes it's just, bash is also a newer shell. So if you learned your shell 30 years ago and you're still using whatever you had then, it can be, uh, it shouldn't really have to it's user preference. And sometimes resource restrictions. Uh, you can set it separately for each user. When we set up all your user accounts on my server, we made it all bin bash, and the default on you has been bash. But generally, if you email your administrator, you can ask them to give you whatever shells installed on the system, and they'll just change the error default shell. Anything else? All right. 